Hello, my name is Kirsten Carter, and I am the head archivist at the FDR Presidential Library and Museum. And in the archives, we house the papers of Franklin D. Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, and about 400 other individuals or organizations somehow associated with the Roosevelt administration. We also operate a research room and uh, our staff and facilities support research inquiries from all over the world, including online reference and uh, digital collections. We try to reach out and support the research of anyone interested in Roosevelt history. And today I am joined by Dr. Abby Gondek, the uh, Morgenthau Scholar in Residence. Hi, Abby. Hello. Hi, could you introduce yourself, please, and, and tell us a little bit about the Morgenthau Holocaust Project? Sure. I'm Abby Gondek, and I am the Morgenthau Scholar in Residence at the FDR Presidential Library and Museum. And I am part of the Morgenthau Holocaust Collections Project, which is a digital history and pathfinding initiative to raise awareness of the FDR Library's unique but underexplored resources for Holocaust studies. We would also like to announce that the FDR Library is hosting a conference. It's a virtual conference this October 10th through 15th, 2021, and it explores digital possibilities in examining the American responses to the Holocaust. More information is available at fdrlibrary.org, where you can find the call for papers and much more detail about the themes of the conference. Now, on this International Holocaust Remembrance Day, I would like to ask Abby to tell us more about her research into the American response to the Holocaust. Uh, in the archives, we house incredible collections really useful for this study, um, including the Morgenthau Diaries, um, the papers of Henry Morgenthau Jr., and the records of what was known as the War Refugee Board. And as I understand it, Abby has begun some really exciting and innovative research into those collections. Abby, could you please tell us a little bit about uh, what's so exciting about these, these materials and your research? Sure. So I thought what I could do first is describe uh, an overall picture of several of the projects that I've been working on. So one of the first projects I started had to do with women's roles in the governmental staff and their impact on the decisions made to try to bring relief and rescue to Jewish refugees in Europe during World War II. So one of my first projects was about uh, the secretary of Henry Morgenthau Jr. And of course he was the secretary of the treasury. So his secretary's name was Henrietta Klotz and she was very influential on him in pushing him to take a more active role in trying to save Jewish refugees. The second project that I started to work on was about rescuing Jewish children from France and getting them into Spain and Portugal and the conflicts between state and treasury about that specific issue and also the conflicts between Jewish organizations about um, how to rescue the children and where to send the children after they had been rescued. So I've created a, a series of videos related to those topics that you can watch on our FDR Library YouTube page. And then my most recent project has to do with the emergency refugee shelter or a refugee camp that was established in the US in 1944. And this project was one of the first major projects that the War Refugee Board worked on. So there are over 3000 letters from the public in support of the camp that was set up at Fort Ontario in Oswego, New York, and they are available online. Where can we find those, Abby? They're posted in Franklin, right? Yes, um, they are posted in the Franklin search database for the FDR library under selected digitized documents related to the Holocaust and refugees. And um, you have to scroll down all the way to the records of the War Refugee Board. And they are listed under admission of refugees into the US general and then all alphabetized A through Z. There are also petitions from the emergency, emergency committee to save the Jewish people of Europe. Um, and then I wanted to show you what one of the folders looks like. So I have opened the A folder just as an example. So each of the folders has the, this is what you would see in the records room. Um, this is the original archival context. So, um, 
it's made up of the usually there is a letter from John Paley, who was the director of the War Refugee Board. That's the kind of first thing that you see. And then the next thing that you would see would be the letter from the public. Um, and sometimes there are multiple letters. Sometimes they address them to the president and also to um, John Paley. And then you'll, and then this is another letter um, from John Paley, a cover letter. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is so interesting, was, right? Because the, people would write either to the president or to or directly to the War Refugee Board, and then we have the record of both sides of that correspondence. So if, yes. the, if the White House received the letter, they would forward it to the War Refugee Board, and we see not only the original letter here, but also the response from the board. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, and sometimes the um, person writing would write to both. FDR and John Paley from at the War Refugee Board. Um, so you have sometimes multiple letters from the same person. So tell me what uh, you're exploring with these letters. What, what research questions and, and new pathways are you exploring with these? So one of the goals with the project was to be able to um, track them in a quantitative way um, it's a huge amount of, of data. So what um, I've done with the help of interns, uh, John, John Tappan and Eileen Dennis, is we've created the, this database of, so far we've gone all the way up through the N folders, A through N. And um, I wanted to show you just what uh, an example of what the, the database looks like. Um, so... Basically, we're looking for all sorts of different information that we can get out of the letters, um, including the gender of the sender, um, including where the letter came from, when the letter arrived, um, was it handwritten, um, was it from an organization or an individual, um, was what were the key terms used in the letter? What was the text of the letter? Um, so all sorts of all, all these sorts of details. And mm -hmm. the reason for this is that um, though the documents that I was just showing you in PDF form, it is somewhat text searchable, but because of the old fashioned style of type, you can't find everything that you need. So this is a very comprehensive way of detailing everything that's in the letters. So then future researchers and people in the public can search through all of this data to find things that might be interesting to them. So mm -hmm. it's very open-ended for future research um, on many different topics. It seems like really, really, really complex data um, really great use of information. It seems also that this would be really neat to um, offer up to the digital humanities com community. Um, can you talk a little bit about how um, the, the digital humanities practitioners might be able to leverage some of this information, this data? Definitely. Um, so one of the ways that I have tried to visually demonstrate that this huge amount of data is to look at the geographic origin of the letters. So from this map, for example, you can see that most of the letters, a huge majority came from the Northeast. And um, there are many different uh, hypotheses for why this might be or ideas about why this might be. Um, it, could, it, it, it could partially be because of um, where there were letter writing campaigns because there's evidence of many different letter writing campaigns within the letters that we've gone through so far. Um, it could also be, you know, these were areas where many Jews lived um, and Jews were writing in support of, as part of letter writing campaigns and also just as individuals in support of the idea of starting a refugee camp in the US. Um, it could also be, there's a huge amount from New York actually so it could be that um, the this you know this is a state where FDR had a lot of support. Um, so a really cool feature that I wanted to show you was the ability to um, click and interact with this map, and then be able to see the original data from from the database. Um, I'll just show you that really briefly. 
Okay, so when you click on a specific city, you, you can open up the data from the uh, original database. So I'll show you an example of that. Okay, so this is an example of the type of thing that you would see when you open up that that specific point on the map or any of the data um, that's being visualized, you can open it up to, to see the original data set, which is, um, so it's, you can both visualize it um, in a more interactive and kind of visually interesting way, but you can also go back to the original data as well. Um, so another, another uh, pattern that I wanted to talk about is, something like the oh when when the letters arrived so this is a graph of the trends of when most of the letters came in so this you can i don't i i hope you can see at the bottom this is may june july august um so most of the letters, a lot of letters came in June. And this matches up with the trend of publicity, of publicity for the um, for the idea of setting up a refugee camp in the United States. Um, so there was uh, in April of 1944, there was an initial article written by Samuel Grafton of the New York Post, and he recommended this idea of free ports. And this was the idea that you could um, apply the idea of a free port to people. So if you can have goods, you know, come into a port and kind of be in like uh, in between zones, so they wouldn't, they wouldn't be charged um, fees and they would kind of just be in a hold, you know, in a holding pattern. So the idea was that you could do the same thing with people and you could bring people, refugees to the United States and um, they could just stay for a little while on a temporary basis um, until the war was over and then they would go back to their homes. So um, this idea of free ports really took hold. So a lot of the letters from the public talk about the idea of free ports, but uh, FDR didn't like that term. And so they ended up choosing the term emergency refugee shelter um, because he liked the idea that it was a shelter. He liked the, the kind of tone of that word and that it was, uh, in, in the case of an emergency, so that it would be, he wanted to emphasize that it would be temporary and that the refugees wouldn't um, remain in the United States, even though many of them did eventually um, end up coming into the United States uh, through regular immigration procedures um, once the war was was over. Um, so, okay. yeah. yeah. Oh, I was going to ask, um, you know, studying the public reaction, you know, what have you learned and, and, and how is how does this kind of add color to the to the larger study of, of this effort? Um, so something that I'm really interested in that I had mentioned before is the role of women in putting pressure on women within the government, putting pressure um, on the government to do more to save refugees. But through this project, I've also learned about women's roles as members of the public and members of organizations, including Jewish organizations. So another uh, graph or visual that I wanted to show you was um, has to do with uh, a type of response where, um, so types of letters where Jews were explicitly mentioned in the letter. So this is actually, um, it was not that common for Jews to be mentioned explicitly as part of the group of refugees, but it did happen. Um, and when Jews were mentioned, it was typically from, from individuals. So you can see, um, so you can see that like the orange is representing um, the letter does not mention Jews. And the turquoise is saying that, yes, the letter does mention Jews. And you can see if the letter mentions Jews, it's more likely that it was an individual. And then this graph down here is showing that it was um, much more likely for women than for men to mention Jews specifically in their letters. Mm -hmm. So if I click on this, 
um, I can go to the full database again that shows me all the all the women who mentioned use explicitly. The example that I wanted to show is from a woman named Mrs. W. Gordon, and she's coming from the uh, North Side District Women's Division of the American Jewish Congress. Here she says, um, we greatly appreciate the splendid work you did in your capacity as the executive director of the War Refugee Board. And we want to assure you that not only the Jewish people in the United States, but every decent American fully supports your humanitarian efforts on behalf of the persecuted Jews of Europe. So here she's actually mentioning Jews two times. Um, and so another one of the things that that I've done is analyze the types of words that appear many, many times. So the uh, words like humanitarian and persecuted are examples of very commonly occurring words. Um, and then um, I also, this is a, a very typical response letter from John Paley. So his response letters were made on templates basically. And so there was slight changes depending on when he sent the response letter. So as time went on and there was more specific ideas about what was, what there was more specific ideas about what exactly the the camp would be, where it would be. Um, so here you can see he's saying that they've established this refugee shelter at Fort Ontario, and they've included some additional materials um, that FDR has written. Um, and then I just wanted to show one more example, um, and this is what I call a four but response. So there was mostly four responses, meaning they were supporting the camp, but there were also a few responses that were in support of the camp, but then, um, so they were in support of the camp, but they felt like there needed to be more done. So that was about 17% of the sample that I was looking at were these four but type of responses. Um, and I found that um, individuals were more likely than organizations to express this type of viewpoint, but also going along with my um, interest in women and gender, um, women were more likely than men to express a four bucks type of response. And then I wanted to show you um, an example of a Jewish women's organization who sent this type of four butts response. So this is coming from a Miss R.E. Carlin um, in Jersey City, New Jersey. She was representing the um, American Jewish Congress, specifically the business and professional women's chapter of the Jersey City Women's Division of the American Jewish Congress. And she, it was, it was actually a resolution. So this was also very common when it, when a letter came from an organization that it would be, um, they would have a cover letter like this one, and then they would have uh, the actual resolution itself. So I just have focused here on the parts of the letter that emphasize this for but type of response. So this, this wording is very common. Um, the failure of the United States of America to take adequate and sufficient measures of rescue would constitute guilt almost equal to that of history's most tyrannic oppressors. And then later she says, um, or actually it's two women that are writing this, um, they say that the stand that's been taken by FDR is commendable, but they think that it needs to be expanded and extended to embrace as large a number of refugees as can possibly um, reach our shores. So this is, the reason it's for but is because it has a bit of critique in it. It's saying we support this idea, but we feel like more needs to be done. And if more is not done, then we're basically being complicit in the murder of all of these people. So that it, it had a very, these types of letters have a very strong kind of, um, a stronger sort of sting to them than the uh, just plain four letters. Um, mm -hmm. So I found these letters to be like the most interesting. And I, I, I also found it interesting that women were more likely than men to express these types of viewpoints. Um, I don't necessarily have a, a kind of explanation for why, but it's just like an interesting finding to explore more. Definitely. It's, it's just remarkable the, when, when you look at, at things so deeply and across so many things, you apply these new uh, kind of computational methods to 
review and analyze, um, you really see trends develop and you can kind of add a lot of, of depth and nuance to examining that response, the public response in this case, uh, you know, reacting to, you know, what the US government was outwardly attempting to do. I think that's fascinating. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that leads me to ask you about future directions. Where is your research headed and, and what kind of uh, future do you see for the, the Morgenthau project? So something that uh, I, I didn't mention, but another part of the Oswego project is looking at the um, mentions of Oswego and the idea of developing a refugee camp in the United States, um, the references to that in the Morgenthau Diaries. So this is a central part of all my research within the Morgenthau Holocaust Collections Project is using the Morgenthau Diaries. Um, and the Morgenthau Diaries were a day-to-day -day collection of all the transcripts and correspondence and meetings and cables that came through the Treasury Department. And because Henry Morgenthau Jr. was so involved with the establishment of the War Refugee Board, there's a lot of War Refugee Board materials in the Morgenthau Diaries. So um, something that I've been working on with uh, interns John Tappan and Eileen Dennis is to track um, the references to Oswego in the Morgenthau Diaries. So I can show you um, another database that we've been working on um, specific to that part of the project. So basically what we're doing is um, any documents that are relevant to Oswego or the idea of a refugee camp in the U.S., um, we're tracking, um, you know, who, who the document was from, who it's to, the date, um, the transcription of the document, the key terms in the document, um, whether the document, um, one second, uh, let's see. We also are tracking things like uh, organizations mentioned, people mentioned, places mentioned, keywords. So again, this is another way to for future researchers, a wealth of information, um, and they could search these types of um, Excel databases in a way that they that it's not able, you're not able to search in the Morgenthau Diaries themselves um, because the Morgenthau Diaries are, they are somewhat text readable, but um, there are some issues with finding things, like I said before, with the, the style of um, the typewriter type. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to sometimes find things. So one of the themes that has emerged from, from this is um, we've been tracking key figures in the story. Um, so Eileen Dennis and I have been working on this timeline of you know, how, how things happened that led up to the creation of the camp in Oswego. And part of that is focusing on key figures. So this is, I just, this is a, a snippet from that timeline. Um, and I, I wanted to focus on Florence Hodel because um, she was involved with the War Refugee Board. She was originally the um, assistant executive director. Um, and when John Paley resigned, John Paley is here on the left. Um, he was the executive director, but then he ended up resigning in 1945. Uh, General O'Dwyer took over, but he was campaigning to become mayor of New York. And so uh, Florence Hodel really stepped up and basically was running the War Refugee Board in 1945. Um, and since I'm so interested in women figures, she's somebody who I'm very interested in exploring more and especially how she appears um, in this story of the creation uh, of Oswego and then the kind of, as Oswego was, there was problems that came up with the refugees um, because they weren't allowed to leave the camp very much and they felt like they were prisoners. And so there's some issues that come up and then she's the one who is sort of um, bringing those issues up with uh, other members of the other staff of the War Refugee Board. And there's also some, Seem, seemingly conflicts between her and Henry Morgenthau Jr. Um, that come up when you're reading through the Morgenthau Diaries. And so that really interests me. So she's somebody who I wanna investigate a little bit more in the future. Wow, so you're expanding to multiple collections and digging yeah. through 
um, not just archives, but uh, you know, lots of information out there about about who really was involved in the the, the refugee effort, and uh, I think that's fascinating. All right, so. Uh, thank you so much, Abby. This has been just um, so exciting to watch your work and uh, see how the project develops. And uh, it also makes me excited about the upcoming conference we have in 2021, um, where we'll be able to kind of showcase this type of research and uh, new possibilities for studying the Holocaust and the U.S. responses to it. So um, again, I hope everybody uh, thinks about participating and joining us for that big event. It is virtual. Um, but more information can be found on our website, fdrlibrary.org. And um, Call for Papers has just gone out. So if you're interested, please do look into it. We'd love to have you participate. So that wraps us up. And I just want to thank everyone for joining us for this at home with the Roosevelt's check-in on the Morgenthau Project. <laughs>